pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now in the humblest way we know how. Ask you first to forgive us of our sins that we've committed in word, thought, or deed. So our prayer may come up to you as a sweet smile and savor. Heavenly Father, we ask that you touch everyone under the sound of my voice. Be with my quell as he looks to continue to help some of the most neediest individuals in our community. Heavenly Father, continue to lift him up when he is feeling weak and discouraged. Heavenly Father, help him to go out amongst those in this community and let them know that change is possible. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for his vision. We thank you, Lord, for the mission that's been placed in his heart and just what he's looking to do and what he has been doing. In your son's name we pray, amen. Amen. In 2017, I started the re-entry and community development center. Uh, we didn't have a physical location at that time. Um, so what I started doing is just community initiatives, and, um, volunteering with other agencies and, and, and doing things like that, renting spaces and having events. Uh, we did a lot around anti-violence um, the end of 2017 and 2018. And then we was lucky enough to get this exact same spot in 2018. So we had a brick and mortar location. Um, but what happened at that time was I wanted it to be a community funded agency, right? I wanted the community to be able to donate and, 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 keep, it, and keep it afloat. But that was a bad business decision. It was a good decision because once you get a 501c3, it's certain regulations and, and, and stipulations that you can't do. You can't endorse political candidates. You can't um, give money to political candidates and stuff like that. I didn't want them type of restrictions. So I tried to go at it alone. I, I started this agency up with my own money and I did it for a year, but it just didn't make sense to have a whole nother year lease. Um, so I had to let the agency go. Um, so that really played, that really played dummy. Um, I, I, was, I wasn't able to meet with people individually. I wasn't able to have the ev community events anymore. Um, so that was really bothering me. So probably like six months ago, um, I started looking for office space. I wanted to just have a location to where I can resume providing some type of direct services to people. Even if it wasn't a building, I just wanted an office space. So the office space that I was coming across, it was just too expensive just to have one room. Um, so one day I was riding past and I seen that this building that I had before was available again. So I said, God, you play too much, God. <laughs> right? So um, I pulled over. I remember backing up and the number was on the building. So I said, let me call my old landlord um, just to see what's going on. And he told me it was available. Um, he told me that um, he was a very good tenant. And we'd love to have you back. Right? So um, I, I just went ahead and I did it again. The difference is, and I'll talk a little bit more, is because this time now uh, we have we have a grant uh, from the Greater Rochester Health Foundation. Uh, so it'll be much easier to, to, to maintain for at least for the next year financially. Um, and then we want to continuously do things that we can raise money. And then a, one of the, a part of that grant is to pay for incorporating as a 501c3. So within the next four to six weeks, we will be an official 501c3. And that is the difference. Right, so um, I'll talk a little bit more about the services that we're gonna provide, um, but what I wanna do is get y'all out of the heat. You've been standing around for a while, so we're gonna do the ribbon cutting, and we just let's count down from 10 backwards. And at one, I'm gonna cut it, and then y'all can come inside. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, bless us. We're back. Y'all can come in. All right, y'all ready? Yes. This is going to be the first time ever that I gave a speech without writing none. I normally write and prepare speeches, but I was just doing so much trying to get the building ready and be presentable for today and that I just didn't have enough time to, um, to write none. So it's whatever. All right, welcome. Welcome, welcome to the Reentry and Community Development Center. We appreciate you. Uh, for coming out. Um, it's always a blessing um, to see citizens come together, especially to support a business. Um, one, it's, a, it's a nonprofit, but at the end of the day, it is a business. And one of my major, main goals is to be able to hire folks. That's my main goal. So when we're asking for donations in the monthly donor, so there, there's an overhead cost, right? That costs for the agency, rent, rg and &E. Once we're able to get enough monthly donors for that, the next tier is to be able to hire employees. What we really, really want to do is hire a part-time secretary first. 
somebody that can be here, had the agency open, um, answer phones, set people up with appointments and stuff like that. So that's gonna be the main goal. And, and mark my words, within the next six months, you're gonna see me posting on Facebook, introducing our first employee. Um, the Reentry and Community Development Center uh, was founded in 2017 um, by myself. I had noticed that there was a void in reentry services. Um, there was other agencies um, that, that was providing reentry work, um, but it was hard for me to navigate those services when I came home. So I said, I might as well go ahead because I'm a social worker too. So as a social worker, you know you all, you're always concerned about the most vulnerable people and me being one myself, a black male, um, re-entry, uh, coming from an impoverished neighborhood, stuff like that. So I said, let me go ahead and, and, and I took a chance. I took a chance with my own money and we started the agency and we was here for one year from 2018 to 2019. And by the grace of God, we back. All right. All right. All right. It's something special about this location. This location, I can throw a rock to my neighborhood where I grew up at. If you ride through Sayo Street right now, it look nice and quiet, right? It's very beautiful now. But when I was coming up in the 80s and 90s, Sayo Street didn't look like that. Our community center had graffiti all on it. Remember that, Nancy? It had graffiti all on the side of it. Everybody names was up there, right? Now, it's painted, it look fresh, it's beautiful, it's trees all through the neighborhood. And Anytime in the 80s and 90s that you ride through Sire Street, you was going to see a few people out there. I don't care what time it was. Now you can ride through there on a day like this, and a time like this, you can ride through there. There's nobody standing on Sire Street. And, and I'm convinced that one of the main reasons for that is because a lot of people are dead or in jail right now. A lot of brothers that I used to stand out there with in the late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of them brothers passed away and a lot of them brothers right now is currently in prison. Uh, my cousin, um, somebody that I was with like this in the streets, he's currently in prison right now serving a long prison sentence. Um, so that's the only reason. There's nothing good. None of us um, really, nobody I know really was successful in the streets. Everybody's story ended um, with a bullet wound or it ended with a, with a lengthy prison sentence. Uh, so when I was in prison, I just didn't want that same fate for myself no more. I didn't want to come home and cause I spent six years in prison and none of my friends ever wrote me a letter. I was in prison for six years and I never got a pink slip for none of my friends. Um, never got a letter, a pink slip or a visit in six years. So what I was thinking was, and they offered me 25 years too, but what I was thinking was, if I would have did 25 years, it's a good chance that I would have never heard from them or seen them again. Right? I just happened to just do six years where I can come home and they still was out here. And then I seen, oh, I love you, man. You know what I'm saying? It was love when I came home. But while I was in prison, if I did 25 years, I would have never seen them again or heard from them. So I said, I can't go back and be around them. Not because I don't love them no more. I still love them to death, right? I just was working out with one of my friends right this morning. But because my, my loyalty changed in prison. I used to be loyal to the streets, right? And very, very disrespectful to my mother. But I seen when I was in prison that family is the ones that's gonna take care of you when you need them. So that's where my loyalty, that's where my loyalty flipped. Now I'm loyal to my family. They tell you right now, they, call, they, they rarely hear me say no. My sister here more than anybody, I don't know why. Right, but, but my family member rarely hear me say no. If I got it, they got it. Uh, because they had me when I was in prison. Um, some of the services that we provide here, um, substance abuse and re-entry support groups, right? I'm a drug and alcohol counselor. I work at Catholic Family Center. I have been working there for um, seven years. And um, so I have a, a case I got New York State certified as a counselor. So that's my expertise. And then you have to understand that drug addiction and criminality has a strong correlation. Why? Because a lot of the times when um, brothers and sisters don't have money uh, for their drug of choice, they resort to having to commit crimes to get high in some cases, right? So you have criminality and, and drug addiction. So I felt like I'd be doing people a disservice if I was just talking about reentry, right? 
Um, so people that have substance use disorders is also welcome to join our support groups. And that's also on the back of the, um, on the car too. So you can let people know if you don't want to go to a traditional NAAA meeting or something like that, um, you can come to our meetings when we start having them again. Um, case care management is that's really working with, um, I don't like to call people clients, but that's really working with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis and connecting them to community resources um, because we're not gonna be able to provide every resource that a person coming home from jail or prison would need here. Uh, so what we can do is we can sit down with you and connect you to those resources. Um, certificates of relief, I have one now. Um, and it helped me because as I wouldn't have been able to be New York State certified as a counselor if I didn't get it. So luckily I had got it, so when it, when it um, came time uh, for me to get my credentials, I was just able to send them my certificate of relief. Uh, what that does is, it, is it, it, um, it stops employers from being able to discriminate against you because of your conviction. Right, so you can, it's not saying that they're gonna, they got to give you the job, but it's basically saying, listen man, I'm rehabilitated. Um, they signed these papers right here. You can't tell me I can't get this job because, strictly because of my record. Now if you're saying I'm not qualified for the position because I don't got certain education, that's different. But if you're saying, oh, I can't hire you because of your um, felony, now nah, that's a different story. You can't do that, all right? I'll go ahead, Greg. So I'm interested to know, when you also offer the preparation of a certificate of good conduct. And I want to just say to you that I've done a extensive amount of research on the difference between a certificate of disability versus a good certificate conduct. of good conduct, which a certificate of good conduct actually restores all of your rights back versus mm. a certificate of disability that restores some things back. Mm. So that's why I asked would, you, would, would, would we offer, would the agency also try to offer the preparation of the application, which is not much different. Mm. It's just one column for a certificate of disability versus a certificate of good conduct. Absolutely, if that's a need, then I'm sure you can just get the forms the same way that you get one form. If that's a need, we definitely try to address that for people. Uh, what we also do too, is uh, we, we can give out free hygiene products. Uh, so we just asking for donations for free hygiene products, that basket empty. <laughs> so we do accept free hygiene products and then we put it in like a Ziploc bag um, because a lot of brothers and sisters that come home from prison or they don't have a job yet and DHS don't give them too much cash especially if DHS is paying the maximum rent they probably won't get no cash right uh, so what we do is give them hygiene products soap deodorant uh, stuff like that they would need and it would be in a Ziploc bag and they're able to get that on a, um, when they attend a, su a support group I will ask them at the end if they need hygiene products and we also um, give, give out daily bus passes so people can get um, back and forth. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what we do with the free hygiene products. What we, also, what we also do, what makes this agency unique is aside from providing um, the direct services, we also engage in a lot of community um, development initiatives. So if you look at the name of the agent, it's the re-entry and community development center. I always felt like as being a social worker, I would be doing people a disservice that's coming home from jail or prison, but I'm not doing nothing to try to enhance the social systems that they expected to interact with, right? So you got people that's, um, that's coming home from jail or prison and they got to get paroled back to their neighborhood that got a high murder rate or is crime infested. So I got to be involved in that. That's the back of my shirt. Right. right, King, stop killing kings. Right. Right? Yeah. Hi, Serena. Hi. Serena is the founder of Rock the Peace, and I volunteer for Youth for Peace. I've been doing it for more, like a year or more now, mm -hmm. and we got to do something, man. Black men, are, no matter how they say it, they don't like the term black on black crime. Mm -hmm. Right? Forgive me if I see black brothers killing black brothers. You got to forgive me for that. Right. Um, so we're black, so we have a lot of black women on the front lines of that issue. It ain't supposed to be like that. Black men is killing black men. Where the solution supposed to come from? Um, so the Community Development Center, we want to be the leaders in criminal justice reform. We want to be the leaders in anti-poverty initiatives. Because all of these things, one of the arguments about crime is that my quote is just a result of poverty. I hate that, I hate that excuse so much, man. 
it got some truth to it. Yeah. But I, I don't think that's the reason why brothers is waking up saying I'm going to go kill somebody because I'm poor right now. <laughs> you got a lot of brothers that's posting money on, on social media. Chain, they got more chain than my little chain. Yeah. And, and, and still engaged in that type of behavior. So they, they don't think they're in poverty themselves. So what we doing is giving them an excuse that they're not going to take the court with them. Them brothers ain't gonna go to court saying, Your Honor, I just wanna let you know I shot that man because I was in poverty. Right. You did what? <coughs> 25 to life. Right. right? That's not that's not a good excuse to take the court. So why are we giving them that excuse? I'm a drug and alcohol counselor. 90%, if my supervisor here, she can tell me, 90% of our clients qualify for DHS, meaning what? They living in poverty. Some of our clients, we see them, the brothers are struggling and going in garbage cans. They really in poverty, but I've never seen none of my clients on the news for homicide. You hear me? Do you hear me? I work with clients for the last seven years straight that I know for a fact living in extreme poverty, but they never on the news for committing a homicide. If poverty was the reason why people commit homicides, then my clients would be always on the news. Oh, you heard such and such just killed somebody last night, right? Because they're living in poverty. Right. But that's not true. So we got to figure out something else because people that's living in extreme poverty, they're not killing nobody, man. So, I'm almost done. I know it's getting kind of hot in here. So, if you look around, what do you notice on the walls? You. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm, not nar I'm not narcissistic, man, trust me. That, those, that, that pain of story, right? Incarceration, activism, um, you want to say professionalism, or however you want to say it, right? So pain, I'm trying to paint a story of change as possible over there. But what else you notice? Words on the walls. Okay, y'all getting, getting warm. What else you notice? Red, black, and green over there. What else you notice? Oh uh, man, I can tell y'all ain't y'all ain't coming out in June. What? Somebody, somebody got it. What else y'all see? The campaign picture. Mike Quill Powell running for city council. I got to clap for that. Oh, yeah, yeah, so who said that? Nobody ain't said that. Oh, y'all did? I'm sorry. Y'all was pointing all over there. Is this still working? I'm running for city council because the, the main reason I decided to run for city council was because I was disappointed or displeased with the way the city has been governed lately. Y'all hear me? Right? So one, of the, so one of the main ways to where you can establish change is by running for political office. You gotta bring it closer. By running for political office. We need a new microphone too. That's why y'all need to donate so we can buy another microphone. <laughs> so by running for political office is one of the ways that you can affect change. I know a lot of the politicians personally. Mm -hmm. I have spoken to them. And leadership is also a reflection of mentality. We have a lot of leaders that run as black folks. I'm a black man, I'm running. For, but rarely run for black folks. We have a lot of politicians that run as black folk. I understand what's going on. I'm a black man, I'm a black woman, right? They, they run it as black people. But rarely run for black people. A lot of them is scared to even mention the word black. They want to say, oh, well, I'm running for everybody. We yeah. understand that, but black folks have been the ones that have been hurting the most decade after decade after decade. So somebody got to do something specifically for black folks sooner or later. I'm not saying I'm going to get in office and that's the only thing I'm going to be trying to do. But when you present development in black neighborhoods, I'm trying to figure out how is it, how is it going to be benefiting black people, right? Because a, de a large development in a neighborhood is a win for who? If I go and build 180 units on the corner of Joseph and Clifford, who is that a win for? Is that a win for the for Joseph community? No, for the developers. Hell nah. The, the win for the community is I'm able to buy a home that I own. If I rent your, your $1,200 unit, 
that's a win for you, right? So what happened, we got to try to figure out, if you're going to be building some type of um, developments like that, can we couple it right. with homes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going right. to build this development, we understand that, we appreciate it, but we also need you to build 30 homes around it right. that, that, right. people, that people right. can buy and All they can right, be there right, and right. because that apartment building is going to be people in and out in and out in and out in and out but them homes people are going to be in that community 20 30 years they mortgage is going to be about 30 years right so they're going to have to stay there and people is more likely to my aunt and i'm gonna make this quick my aunt she live on emerson street right but she live on the good side of emerson so i asked her i said auntie i said why is the emerson from lao to to like lake why it looks so bad? Mm -hmm. And then from your side, from from Lyle, now that's that Lyle or that's Dewey? No, from Dewey, Dewey, Dewey from Dewey to, uh, what's the other side going that way, Mount Reed. Mount Reed. And she live on that side, Mount Reed side. So I said, Auntie, why is your side of the street look so good, but if you go down there, you gotta roll your windows up, lock the door. Mm -hmm. What y'all think she said? She said, she said, nephew, we all own our homes on this side. That's right, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. right. 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 Yeah. She said, we all own our homes on this side. Uh -huh. So we, we got to really push for the city to invest into, they call it low density, right? Low density housing, single family housing to where people can buy in these neighborhoods. And at the very least, like my mentor Howard Eagle said, at the very least, mixed, right? One apartment building right here, 20 homes, right? We, we need to come, come up with some type of formula. If you're going to be building a certain amount of units in one, in one single circumference, you also have to be building a certain amount of single family homes in that same circumference, or you got to have somebody at the table and say, nah, I vote no on that project. Until y'all able to, to, to guarantee that it's going to be 20 homes along with that building, come back and see us in about five years. We'll be all right. They got, it has to be built inside the um, contract. Antonia, she running for city council as well. It, it, has, it has to be inside those agreements, but you, you have to have people in city hall. <laughs> I'm almost done, I promise you. Watch it work for Thanks, it. Hold on. Oh, she's done broke. Right, but you have, to, but you have to have um, elected officials at city halls that has that type of mentality, right? Uh, so that's one of the things we want to do. One of my platform is um, rebuilding some of our most undervalued neighborhoods. Another one of my platforms is restoring downtown Rochester. All right, now. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Raise your, yeah, raise your hand okay. if you remember how Roch I mean, how downtown used to look in the '90s when we yes. was on the. When we was on the carousel, when you can go in one building and come out damn near across town through the Skyway. I used to, I used to walk, go inside Midtown Plaza and I come out in the back of my Avenue on my way to middle school. Um, we can go in the basement and, and, yeah, we can go in the basement and they got parrots down there, birds, all types of stuff. We can go in McCurdy's. We had all of these uh, all day Sunday. We had all of these businesses, gold stings, means. Yeah, I remember we used to go. We used to go downstairs and we used to go downstairs and um, I forgot what it was called. And we used to go buy the we used to go buy the gold fronts from down there. You remember the brother used to shine the shoes down there? Go through there right now. Well, I'm gonna tell you what it done turned into. I'm gonna tell you what it turned into. Downtown Rochester has turned into an upper class residential neighborhood. If you go, by Nancy, if you go through downtown Rochester on any given day around five o'clock, you will see people walking their dogs, they down there skateboarding. It's like, hold on, hold on, I know this ain't, this ain't downtown. But if you go to Pittsburgh, if you go to Charlotte, North Carolina, they downtown's booming. Yeah. Soon as it started getting, as soon as it started getting dark, you see lights going up on buildings. They got uh, um, electric billboards everywhere. There's it's hundreds of bars down there. There's things to do right downtown. So I don't know what's going on. Down your listen. Never forget this. What I just said. Your downtown Rochester right now is a direct result of who's in office. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 
down, downtown yeah. or, or who was in office for the, in the last 20 years, but a lot of them been in the last four to eight years right now. There's no other explanation. Right. Buildings don't move right. themselves. Sure it be, how would you, listen, let, let me tell you this. Midtown Plaza was the first indoor shopping mall in the yeah. United States, right? Yeah. So, so what you got it? So what you got? Somebody got to help me understand this. Right. How in the hell do you go from that to an empty lot for the last 15 years? I don't know. In the heart of downtown. <laughs> help me understand that. How do you go from having the 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 first indoor mall in the United States to it being an empty lot for 15 years? Nobody said, yo, we got to have something like it, or we got to have something better. Ain't nobody say that yet. Nope. Those types of decisions are a direct result of leadership. Yeah, going to vote for them. And then this is one. This is one of my pet peeves. I say, oh, I'm running for city council, right? This is this is what this is what I've been getting so far. I'm running for city council. Oh, so Michael, what are you gonna do? I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I got a little, I got a little platform, but what I'm gonna need you to do is go ask the ones y'all voted for what are they doing now? Let me get in there, and you're gonna see what I can do. But you already can see what's been going on, and you still prepared to vote for them. Still, we just said downtown is horrible, but you're still gonna vote for the same ones in Auburn. We just said, uh, I ain't just say this, but this is a fact. Almost 70 people was murdered in Rochester in the last 14 months, but y'all still gonna go vote for these same politicians. They have a, Rochester have a public safety committee. They have a whole department that they, that they whole job is to address violence and, and, and the safety, the democratic promise of safe and vibrant neighborhoods. If you live in Rochester, do you, is your neighborhood safe and vibrant? I'm not talking about East Avenue, South Avenue, those neighborhoods. If you live on Joseph, if you live on J Street, J Street Jefferson J Avenue, J um, North, Cl Hudson North, Hudson North Clinton Hudson Avenue, Hudson, Hudson, Hudson Avenue, do you feel like your neighborhood is safe and vibrant? No. no. But you, you had a politician come to you every election year saying, you vote for me, we're going to have safe and vibrant neighborhoods. And never see it. That's, that's, they, they saying it now. They got whole campaign commercials about it. So I promise you, I've always been telling Howard, Howard really, he know me, he know me a little bit. He, he know me probably better than a lot of people in this room. And it's difficult for, I was just talking to my landlord this morning. I told him, I said, um, I said, you know I'm running for city council, you gotta help me get in there, brother. Guess what he said? He said, oh man, you ain't gonna do nothing but what all the rest of them do when they get, the, when they get in there and get that money, they gonna do the same thing, forget about the people. <laughs> So I said, I'm not even gonna wait. I'm not even gonna waste my breath arguing with the brother. I said, man, that ain't me, and that's it, right? But that lets you know that that's historically how it's been going down. People have been running as black people, right? Oh, I'm a black man. I come from such and such. I know the I know the struggle. But then when they get in office, I had put this. On, I put this on Facebook recently. I said, when people get elected to public often, something happened. Some some happen when they when they when they take that oath from compared to what they were saying on the trail, and then when they take that oath, some happen because they conform. They start doing the same exact thing that has been do, has been doing for years, right? And so I promise you that won't be me. And if it is, you if it is, you got to come to me and say, Yo, my call. You was just like the rest of them. You was talking all that shit at your grand opening. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry for cursing here. Yeah, oh yeah, Serena, Serena ain't gonna play. She was like, I knew you was going. Y'all got a protest in front of this building. I'm not talking about any little thing I do now. Come on now, don't do me like that. But you know, if, if it's the middle, if it's the middle of Black Lives Matter, right? And the whole city is mad at how the Rochester Police Department been treating our people, in that moment, you don't go vote for a $16 million police headquarters. You don't do that at that moment, right? So if I, I'm talking about if I do something like that, then you got to come at me and say, Mike Coyle, come on, man, this ain't what we voted you for. But for little stuff, man, come on, man, don't do me like that. <laughs> I believe I will win. All right. We hope so. I believe you can win.
the West Side. Yeah, Zenobia not gonna let me forget that West Side. See, see, listen, hold on. Hold on, listen. Y'all don't get mad at me because I got to be honest, right? Zenobia, my coworker, she just said, don't forget about the West Side. <laughs> right? But that's what you telling me. You have to go to Willie Lightfoot and say it sounds like you don't forgot about the West Side. Don't tell me that. See, that's what I'm trying to say. See what I'm saying? Voters, voters with some sort of blind allegiance to incumbents vote for them no matter what they have done. But people that's coming to try to get those seats, they want they gonna give me the higher time. What you gonna do? Listen, Jefferson Avenue is the same way it looked it 30 years ago. The only nice thing on Jefferson Avenue is the barber shop over there, Lightfoot Square. And I say the same thing if the brother was in the room right now. Right? Imagine me, imagine me being on city council and I'm not advocating for the neighborhood that I come from. Right. It just won't happen. It just can't happen. So y'all have to hold your, your current elected officials um, to the fire. And then once I get in there, and then that's when you hold me to the fire, All right? right? right. But, but, but base your decision to vote for me, I have been doing this for years. I have been doing this for years. I have been in the community for years anti violent even before I started volunteering with, um, with Serena and Youth for Peace, I was doing my own um, anti-violence initiatives. Back in 2017, 2018, I have been doing this for years. So, so judge me off that. I am the only practicing social worker that's running for city council. But ain't they asking for social workers to step up right now? They want social workers to step up right now, but they ain't been calling on us. Now they want us to tag team with the police. Hell no, nah, we ain't. <laughs> they want us to start doing the police job. Right. They want us to start responding to calls, just us. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, um, somebody said they about to kill their stuff over here. Right? Why can't you train police officers to be social workers? Right, right. They get like 70, 80,000 a year. Yeah. Social workers don't get that much money. If social workers are responding to calls by themselves, they need to be getting paid $80,000 a year. Because they're doing two jobs. They're doing the job of a police officer. We're supposed to, oh, police not trained. So you mean to tell me you've been on the force for 30 years, you ain't learned on the job? You ain't got no on the job training? Right, you putting up to the scene, you see a brother that's distraught, look like he under the influence. I'm sure you have seen that a hundred times. But you act as if you're a rookie when you encounter that. Yeah. Right? Ain't you supposed to learn on the job? Yeah. So there shouldn't be no excuse. The police officer have been on the force 15 years and you saying, um, oh, he's not trained to do that. So what he been doing for the last 15 years? Right. That he can't talk a brother down from that got a knife. You got a gun, bulletproof. You got all this. You, you, you trained to shoot and you want to shoot down a brother that got a knife? Thank you. What happened to what happened to the what happened to the training? So what you got to do is you got to make sure that you have elected officials that's able to um, verbalize that, that's able to um, to make that type of connection. A social worker can definitely always see that, right? So in a nutshell, the Reentry Community Development Center is back. Um, you have the um, yeah, you can clap for that. Um, you have the, you have the information and the services that we're gonna be providing. And I'm gonna tell you this, for the first month, election is June 22nd, right? And we have some literature up there too, if you wanna take that with you. Uh, the election is June 22nd. We have to come out and vote in record numbers, yeah. right? Because yeah. politics is, is, is kinda crazy, right? They already doing little stuff, trying to get people knocked off the ballot and doing all that crazy stuff instead of just, run, instead of just running your platform, right? So I'm gonna need Everybody that say they support Mike Quell for city council to also back that up by going out and voting for Mike Quell for city council, right? Because we're going to need everybody to turn out. The Reentry right. Community right. Development Center is here, um, but for the first month and a half, because June we really got to focus on the campaign, it's going to be more of a, of a campaign headquarters. What's the date? June 22nd. It'll be more of like a, a campaign headquarters that we're going to be coming here. We're going to be making phone calls. We're going to be sitting, m mailing letters and doing all that stuff from here. And then around June 1st, mm -hmm. we'll begin having support groups for reentry 
um, and, doing, and providing those types of services. But I think immediately I would start taking people on on a one-on-one -on -one or individual basis. Uh, but as far as the support groups, we'll start doing that um, probably around June 1st or somewhere down the line. Now what type of support group you going to have? Um, substance abuse and re-entry support group. So anybody that's struggling with a substance use disorder or recently came home from jail or prison, uh, we have a support group in here and we talk about various topics, how they address, uh, address some of the barriers um, that you, you just came home, what's some of the issues that you're running into, right? And then I can say, hey, I, I ran into that same issue when I came home in 2008, right? So it's those types of resources and types of support groups. Um, thank you so much for coming out. I do want you to um, leave a donation, grab a plate, and um, you got my information, and keep in touch. I love you and I appreciate you. Oh, oh, yeah. And I'm <laughs> See, I told y'all I gotta leave a donation. I'm gonna get a new microphone. Um, take a picture with me before you leave. I'm putting my mask on. <laughs>